let's get started with today's lecture. Um, today we'll talk more about how you think as a researcher. You know, after after we talked about more of the philosophy of social science uh, uh, last week, today it's going to be a little more applied about how do you go about finding a research problem or how do you uh, how do you find a question. Uh, and I will talk you through different ways how to do that. But uh, first, let me mention it is time of the first assignment. So I haven't put it up online yet, but I will do so this afternoon. So we will find it on Blackboard under assessment or assignment. It's on the left hand side. And there you, you then will have a PDF to download. And you will find it. It's very straightforward. And um, next week, the seminars will start. Right, so what is the procedure with what is the procedure with these assignments? Uh, just to remind us all that we are all on the same page. You, know, you get the assignment from Blackboard. It will be there this afternoon, and then you complete the assignments. You write your name on it, student number, and the name of the tutor, so that we identify things. You know, we don't want things to get lost. You don't want things to get lost. Uh, and then you complete the assignment and you bring it with you to the seminar starting next week. You know. Show to your tutor and you leave it with the tutor. There's no online submission for this whole thing, but it's all printed out and you bring it with you. And uh, uh, last disclaimer you can miss one of these assignments seminars without loss of points. Yeah? But for every other one, every next one that you will then uh, lose points for. Okay, so that's the assignment. Uh, so let's, start, let's get started with today's lecture. But before we do that, I have a little, little uh, um, question for you guys. So, take out your phones, your computers, whatever you have. Crime rate. I feel like this light pulling you know, to see what's happening there. It's always exciting for me to see what you guys are coming up with. Obviously, from um, from making a questionnaire or a survey point of view, these kind of things are really useless, to be honest. And the reason is because you see what other people answer. And actually, we will have a whole lecture on how that distorts your view on things. So people answer completely differently when they see what other others have answered before. Uh, so when you do these kind of things, what you normally should do, you should should set it up in such a way that people can't see it, what others are saying. But anyway, we'll come back to that in, uh, at the end towards the lecture. So it's a little bit of a cliffhanger. And I'm just going to, uh, I'm not going to uh, resolve it now. So we will resolve it at the end of the lecture when we talk about puzzles. Yeah? So I want to talk about puzzles and that's one of the, that's quite a big puzzle actually that we have. Which country has the highest crime rate? Well, the puzzle is that it actually is a country that you would not have expected it to be. Anyway, so let's get started. But first, I, I give you a bit of a, of, a, of a motivation for what we do when we do research or sociological research. It's a bit of a, a um, I don't know, what, what we are striving to do, or at least what I'm striving to do when I'm doing research, and what, what many other people, uh, colleagues do as well before I then start talking about how you find research questions and puzzles, that's one of the things to go about it. Yeah. So, one thing about scientific research is that it's not the opposite of being creative. Sometimes people think scientific research is, is not creative. Yeah. I think it's very much creative, yeah, especially sociology, because um, in sociology you can be incredibly creative in what you do. Yeah. That's, to be honest, that's one of the reasons why I love being a sociologist. Because I can really think, I can I just have to open my eyes, I don't need to have 
huge laboratory uh, equipment. I don't need to have a satellite or a spaceship or whatever. I just need to have my thoughts, right? Of course, sometimes then you need to go out and collect data, so you might need some resources, but for some kind of research, you don't even need that. Yeah? So I wrote papers where I end up simulating my own data. So I write computer programs that produce data that I'm then dealing with. And uh, this is still all very, very scientific. So you can be incredibly, incredibly creative in being a sociologist. Yeah? And um, all that we need is really our, the thing between our ears. You know, we need to have our brain and to think things through. So if you think that systematic research, the stuff that I talked about last year, rules out being creative, you're wrong. And actually, the best stuff that I've seen is very creative in getting towards understanding why something is the way it is. Another thing that you do when you are a researcher, you want to take things apart. You really want to scrutinize things really down to the nitty gritty detail, really rip it apart yeah, as much as you can, and then you look at the pieces in front of you. So, for example, on Friday I started this new research project with uh, two students, and uh, we look at, I don't know, how it is that when you get to know each other, why you then interact with each other in a better way. Yeah. You think this is sort of a no-brainer, yeah? when you know somebody better, you know what those people are doing in a way, and then you can adjust your behavior somehow. Yeah? We look at that in the context of teams. Actually, we look at that in the context of English Premier League football teams. And we look at uh, how teams get better when the players know each other for more. So you see, this is already quite creative. You, know, you, can, you can study football teams, and this, you can study social dynamics and social interaction at play. But what I wanted to talk about here is that we're really ripping this apart. We really want to have this relationship between okay, knowing each other and kind of then somewhat changing our, the way we interact with each other, we really want to dig into that. So whenever you think that you kind of reach that point where, you, where your common sense tells you or your, your intuition tells you, okay, this is how it is, as a researcher, you dig deeper. Yeah? You kind of go a little bit further, you rip it apart a little more to, to really show that, that uh, and really get to the mechanisms of what is driving uh, the things that you observe. Yeah? So taking things apart. Um, you need to be curious. Yeah, I think curiosity is key in this whole thing. Um, you need to be curious about the world. You need to be curious about people around you. You need to be curious about society around you. And um, uh, I hope that, I don't know, if you take one thing out of this course is that you are a little more curious about things that you do and, and have an idea about how to be systematic about that and how to do research about that. And when you have something, you know, as I just said, uh, go deep dig down there and really uh, go to the bottom of things. Okay, so um, one last thing, and then I tell you why I'm telling you all these kind of things. Um, you also need, as a researcher, you need to challenge your thinking. So some of the best people that I met, or best sociologists or researchers in general, they really challenge your thinking. They flip things around. Yeah? And then you think, okay, we thought about it in this way all the time, but suddenly, hang on, maybe it's, Maybe it's just flipped around. Maybe, maybe the world just works in a slightly different way, which might explain the same things. So we are very easy, or we have this tendency to think in the ways that we are just being brought up, or the way things work. But as a researcher, you need to challenge that. Yeah. So when you observe something, you need to challenge, and you always need to say, hang on a moment. Is it really like that? What about uh, um, another explanation that looks at this from a different angle? And when you read the really good stuff, and I can recommend you to read the good stuff, in sociology it's very straightforward. You read the journals, uh, the stuff published in, we have two main journals, uh, called the American Journal of Sociology and the American Sociological Review. So these are sort of the key journals. So if a dude like me wants to get tenured in Ivy League University, that's sort of where I have to publish. You know, that's sort of what I have to do. Uh, and when you look at these journals and you read the papers in there, often they have that component. You know, they have this component where they flip something around. Like there's a body of research where people looked at things in a certain way, and then they're sort of like, almost like a paradigm shift. Uh, uh, um, Thomas Kuhn would call it a paradigm sh shift, uh, that you look at things in a slightly different way. So you need to allow your brain to do that. Okay, why am I doing that? Because I think the university, the university sometimes teaches you, especially during the first year, they take these things away from you. Yeah? 
You go to a lecture, you listen to what the guys say, and uh, you just write it down, uh, and then you kind of go home, you repeat it, and you memorize it by heart and so on. And oftentimes, people lose, during the first years of the university, this creativity, this curiosity, you know, this idea to really take things apart, to go deep, and to challenge the, the views. Because you're there, and they're there, I don't know, people, they're supposedly experts, you know, like me, some people standing in front of you, and they tell you how things go. So I observe that the university often tries to take that away from you. So hold on to that, because later on, you know, I'm having a really hard time sometimes to teach masters and PhD students to, 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 to come back to these kind of things, yeah. to reconnect to the creativity and the curiosity that they lost on the way. So my recommendation is just really keep hold of that, yeah. keep on to that. So how do you start research? Yeah, so this is sort of some general thoughts, but how do you start it? Well, it all starts with your research question. That's sort of the real starting point. Your research is only going to be as good as your research question. So this is sort of where it all starts. Sounds trivial, but I cannot emphasize it here. Yeah? Sometimes people start with, um, uh, with something like this is what they want to start, or this is what they want to find, even worse. Yeah? But no, you need to start with the research question. You better start with a good question, better start with a big question, something that is important. So how do we find a question? Yeah, because yeah, at the end, you know, your answer is only going to be as good as the question that you have. So how do we find good questions? So this is what I'm going to focus on during this lecture. I'm going to talk you through six different possibilities of starting your research. Yeah. Coming up with this question or this um, uh, starting point. And then we'll talk, we'll talk later on how then when you have a question, how you're going to answer it potentially, then how you're going to set up a research design around it, how you're going to collect data for it and so on. So how do you analyze the data and so on. But it all starts with the research question. Yeah. So when you do a research project, you really need to think, but your research question very long, very hard. So when I have students, this is sort of really where I'm pushing them very hard at the beginning. Yeah? They always think, oh, Thomas, leave me alone. I just want to do this. Yeah? But I say, no, think about your question. Because if you get that wrong, it's not going to get better. So how can you find a research question? Or how can you start your, your research? Well, the first point is, it can be about your personal experience. Yeah? So uh, you start with something that you have in person interest in. For example, let's assume that you are a second generation migrant in Ireland, and you want to know more about how successful the integration of migrants uh, works into Irish society in general. Yeah. Or another thing, um, let's say you might be coming from an Arabic country, and suddenly you are barred entry into the United States. Yeah. So there's a personal personal interest in that, a personal experience that you might have. And, um, well, generally, uh, you better do something that you're interested in, or something that you're passionate about, because I think if you're not passionate about something, you're not going to be good in it anyway. Yeah? So the people that are good in what they do, they're often also very passionate about what they do. Okay. Um, you know, do something that interests you, something that excites you. So uh, I don't, for example, I don't like boring stuff, and I don't do boring, don't like boring research. So I try to not do boring research. So I do stuff that actually I find really exciting and that I find interesting, like looking at English Premier League football teams. Uh, so and um, what are the downsides of personal experience? Yeah. Well, personal experience, although it can be a good motivation for us to get started, you know, and really link something within our personal interests. Um, the big problem with personal experience is that it can cloud your judgment. Right? It can cloud your judgment. Um, sometimes people are so much into something and have such strong opinions about things, you know, that they only see what they want to see. And this can be very dangerous, because you know, then you have a very distorted view on things. So, a little story that I have a few years back, I was, um, I was meeting this guy, Duncan Watts, he's sort of one of my heroes, you know, he's now head of, or he's working for Microsoft Research, but he used to be this key-ass professor at Columbia University. He's a big guy in, in social network analysis, kind of stuff that I do. And uh, 
you know, we were sitting together and we talked about how recruitment of students into this Ivy League university works, you know, and, uh, and he, he confessed to me, you know, he was reading through these applications, you know, that people send in and they have to write a personal statement and so on. And he was always very cautious when somebody was really, really into something. Yeah. When it's almost overly personal. And the reason was because he said people have then clouded judgments about things. They cannot look at things scientifically anymore, systematically anymore, because there's so much into it. Yeah. So that can be that can be a pro uh, that can be a problem, and uh, that's something to keep in mind when you do research. Yeah. Uh, think about your own role in that. Think about your own thinking in it. Yeah. Are you thinking now in a certain way because this is something that really touches you? Yeah. Let's say you want to study. Um, for example, some colleagues of mine, they, they have a research project on repeal of the eight right now. Which is very important. As sociologists, this is actually a topic that we really need to look at, that we need to study in a way. But things can be very, very heated. Yeah? Things can be, uh, uh, you can be so much into it that at the end you, you want to find something from the get-go without having, ever having started the research to begin with, right? So it's important to have that objectivity in, in your research. Okay, so we talked about that last week briefly. You know, science is the bending. Science is uh, the bending over backwards to prove yourself wrong. It's a quote from Richard Feynman. So especially when you are heavily involved in a research topic personally, you need to be self-critical and constantly strive for objectivity. If you don't do that, you become an instrument of yourself at best or of somebody else at worst. So that's personal experience. Okay, let me talk about another one, and again, I'm going to talk about uh, what it is and then what potential problems with it, with it are. You can start your research project as a replication project. What is replication? Well, it's basically another strategy to start research and find a research question. And it is an attempt to address exactly the same research questions that others already had before, uh, and seeing whether you can come with it, end up with the same conclusions that they came up with. And it's not a bad strategy. Yeah? Why is that important, replication? Well, because we all make mistakes. Yeah? This is just how life is. We all make mistakes. Academics make mistakes. It's completely human. And believe it or not, even professors make mistakes. And we should not be afraid of making mistakes and discovering mistakes or having others discover our mistakes. Frankly, when I'm going to a conference, I'm giving a talk, and everybody just likes what I do, this is just a waste of time. I don't know, you want to go there, you want to get feedback, because only then you can get better. So, you need to get into the habit, and that's why I'm stressing it here, you need to get into the habit of not being afraid to make mistakes. You need to expose yourself, because if you don't get into that, you will not get better. So when you have a research project, you come to, I don't really talk about this research project, depending on where you are, I will always tell you where your mistakes are. Because you don't want to hear what you did right. I don't know, this is a waste of, of time. You want to get better, right? And the only way to get better is by knowing where you actually can get better. Can, can get better. So we all make mistakes, and researchers make mistakes. You know? So replication is an important uh, uh, tool to discover these kind of mistakes. First of all, you can replicate yourself. I always replicate myself. So when I start a research project, you know, sometimes I do fancy statistical models and, and write syntax files and stuff. And it's easy to make mistakes there. So I do that, I come up with my analysis, I look at my findings, and then I kind of put the whole thing away. I put it away for a week or two, and then I start from scratch again. I do exactly the same thing without knowing how I did it. Or trying to, I try to forget about how I did it. Yeah. I approach the same problem again. And when I come up with the same result, then I'm really confident in my findings. So I'm replicating myself. That's sort of like a good strategy and how it actually should, uh, uh, um, what, what you can do. So you can test yourself. You can see whether you can, you can you come up with the same stuff so that you trust your own research, your own work. But it's also about replicating others. Yeah. So um, in the academic community, this is becoming more and more popular. People nowadays, in the sciences, they did this for a long time, but now in the social sciences, it's picking up too, that people 
provide replication packs. Basically, they provide the data that they collected and then they put it on the website and say this is sort of how I did it. And it's not just the, the project or the, the, the paper or the book that was published out of it. It's really like the nitty gritty details about how they derive their findings that you can track down. So I had this tool like a, a while back, you know, the student contacted me about this paper that I wrote three years ago and asked me, Thomas, can you give me the replication pack? Yeah. So he wanted to replicate my analysis. Now, that's scary when somebody contacts and says, okay, uh, hopefully I didn't do anything wrong here. Yeah. But that's exactly how it should be. So that, first of all, you don't make mistakes and that others actually have the chance to detect your mistakes and then to take it also further. Yeah. So you will learn from your mistakes and uh, uh, you, um, you have an opportunity then to also take it further from there. So, for example, one of my PhD students, Travis, um, we're working on a project. It's about social networks and obesity in adolescence. Yeah. Basically, it's about why your friends are, have a similar fitness status as you are. You have. Yeah. Actually, that's something that we, that we find. So fit people tend to be friends with other fit people and the other way around as well. And this is sort of some research that people have done in the US, they've done it in some countries in Europe, in Spain, but they haven't done it in I don't know, a bunch of other countries that we are looking at it now. So we are replicating analysis, this is sort of the starting point for this. We start with what other people did, and we're replicating this, but then we're sort of extending it now to another country. And while we are doing that, actually then you kind of see all these avenues, all these questions pop up by doing that, where you think, okay, now I can extend it in this direction. For example, now we're looking at not just you know, the technical term is, obese, is called social clustering uh, or homophily, yeah, that your friends are similar to you. Now we're looking not just at homophily, but we're looking at the strength of relationships. So we're looking at whether this, this obesity clustering that we have, whether it's more pronounced for strong friendships than compared to for weak friendships. So there we sort of we dig, we dig in, we go in and we kind of we get to that point by first replicating what others did, you know, building on their work, building on their research, and then kind of putting it on there. Which is a, which is a very um, safe thing to do as well, you know, because you're not sort of out in the ocean in a way. When you have a completely outlandish idea, you're out, of the ocean, out in the ocean and sometimes it's hard for you to connect to existing research. Um, don't ask me when you... I did this football stuff during my PhD and that was just really outlandish. People thought, what the hell are you doing? It was a very risky, very risky strategy. Anyway, so um, replicating others. Replicating others. Don't be afraid to expose yourself and don't be afraid to expose others. Great people learn from their mistakes. What are sort of the problems with replication? Well, the big problem with replication is that you might lose sight. Huh? Because you're so, you lose your imagination. You're so focused on doing what others have done before that you even go and operationalize things in the same way that you lose the bigger picture. That's an easy mistake that can happen. I call it the Dutch mistake. Somehow Dutch universities do that. <coughs> students, PhD students, they sort of do this tiny little increment and they don't see the bigger picture anymore, or very often. <coughs> Uh, you know, don't get me wrong, I really love the Dutch university system. I think they have terrific sociology programs. I can highly recommend that. But when I look at the people coming out of the PhD programs, that's often sort of the, the problem that they face. That they don't have this imagination anymore. That they don't see the bigger, the bigger picture. So when I do some research, you know, I read a lot. But then I try to forget that for a moment. Why am I doing that? So that I have this, this almost virgin view on things. Because when you're sort of read stuff, especially when you're kind of you're into this and you read research articles in a way, you start thinking along those lines and along those lines only. Yeah, and that can be problematic because then you're losing you know, what I mentioned earlier, this creativity, this kind of this spark, this imagination that you guys, I think, all have. I think that's a natural human thing that we have that, but you can very easily lose that. So while replication is a very safe strategy in some ways, you know, because you're connecting to an existing body of research, you need to keep in mind that you don't get sucked in too much into that and that you lose your imagination. Okay, so that's personal experience and replication. Now let me talk about a third way how you can start your research project and find the research question that you're looking at. Well, you can find a research gap. 
you could find a research gap, either being it in the theoretical literature or in the empirical literature or where else, and then you, then you try to fill that gap. Well, what is a research gap? Well, when you read papers or you know, look at what, what uh, researchers produce, at the end of the papers they often say, this is something else I could have done here. I didn't have the time, I, don't, I cannot do everything in this paper, I cannot do everything in this article, but here I write what else needs to be done. Yeah. This is a research gap. So um, an example that I have here, um, for example, you know, there's this big literature about social mobility, social stratification, social mobility. Social mobility means, or well, more precisely, social immobility means uh, um, that often people end up with the same kind of jobs as their parents. Yeah. That's just a fact. That's a social fact. Of course, there are sort of, I don't know, uh, variations in that, but uh, people are much more likely to end up with the same jobs as their parents. Uh, look at me. My dad, he was a teacher. He wasn't at the university, but here I am, you know. So, um, why is that? Well, often it is because um, you just know a little more about a job. You know, I had just much more access to the life of a teacher instead of to the life of a lawyer or of a scientist. Yeah. I didn't really know how that works. It was just really outlandish out there because I didn't know anybody. Yeah. But I knew very clearly what a teacher does because my dad was one. Yeah. So, this is social mobility. That's sort of like a big research field. You know, people study these kind of things. And then people, people realize, hang on a moment. Theoretically and also practically speaking, we shouldn't just look at parents here. You know, people looked at parents-children relations for the longest time. But then you know, all the theoretical arguments that they had, they were about these kind of things, getting exposed to different ideas, getting exposed to different lifestyles, and so on. Yeah? Well, you also get exposed to different lifestyles through other family members, through your grandparents. And then people started to look at the effect of grandparents on children. And they also found that there's a this strong, what we call that a correlation, between your grandparents' occupation and your occupation. Or more precisely, in this case, it's about sort of class. So depending on which class your grandparents were from, that determines, well, not deterministically, but it kind of affects your chances to end up in a certain social class. Which is crazy to think about it. You know how our lives are structured in a way that we are not really aware of it? or that we really can't do anything about it, but it's still out there. Why am I talking about this here? Well, theoretically we have this idea now that your family members matter for you. Yeah? Because you're exposed to them. You get, I don't know, maybe you get some knowledge from them, maybe you get support from them. When you have a problem, you know, when I'm a, when I'm a teacher, and actually I do that, you know, sometimes I'm hey, Dad, how am I going to deal with those 500 students? Yeah. Then he gives me advice. He tells me stuff. I couldn't ask him about uh, a legal issue. Because he has no fucking clue. Yeah. So, um, so th this is sort of where you then have social mobility coming into play, and people started to look at the grandparents' effect. So, last two years ago, I started this research project with a colleague of mine while I was in Sweden. Before I came here, I was a professor in Sweden, um, and we looked at the role of aunts and uncles. That was the research gap. It was very clear, okay, we have this literature on social stratification, social mobility, family members matter for people's lives. They matter for where people end up with, with kind of jobs, you know, kind of lifestyles that they end up with, and so on. But people hadn't really looked at the importance of aunts and uncles. Why didn't people do that? Well, sometimes it's because people didn't have the opportunity to, to, to do this kind of research. You know, sometimes you need to have the data for it. How do you get data about aunts and uncles and their jobs and about, uh, about the children's jobs. Well, you can do surveys and whatnot, but when you're in Sweden, Sweden is, by the way, a social scientist paradise in the sense because uh, you have data on everybody. Now they have this scary thing that everybody has a person number. I had a person number. And you are in the records for eternity. So we looked at data of everybody who ever lived in Sweden in the last 30 to 40 years. And we could basically map the entire population of the country. We could map through financial, through tax records and family records. We could reconstruct the family networks of an entire country. And then we could identify the occupations that aunts and uncles had and the occupations that their nieces and nephews have. So that was a research gap. And that was a research gap that we, that we went out to, to fill. 
So these gaps, you know, they can be empirically, this was an empirical gap, but sometimes it's also a theoretical gap that you can, you can close. Uh, so how do you find the gap? Sometimes it's really obvious, yeah? but sometimes you just look at the research, you look at the end, you know, that's, you know, good research articles always have that at the end. They tell you, listen, this is sort of what, what would the next steps be, yeah? following from that. Or you look at, the, at some, some wider literature in there. When you, when you have that approach, well, it's a bit similar with replication, uh, you, you can lose the big picture because then you're so focused on filling this little gap you know, that you don't really see where you are anymore. You know? But nevertheless, it's very, very important to fill these gaps. And this is practically how, how, how research often works. You know? It's like this incremental process where tiny little additions are being made. You know? So now the answer is, I don't know, Hopefully soon it's going to be published. There's this paper about the importance of aunts and uncles for nieces and nephews in terms of their social class, in terms of their social occupation, and so on. Okay, so that's the research gap. Let me move on to um, a fourth way of starting your research and defining the field that you look at. You can, you can have a theoretical starting point. Yeah. Mm. What do I mean by that? Well. Remember what we talked about last time, uh, you can go and you can test the theory. Uh, you can go and you can test the theory, uh, uh, you can try to prove it wrong. Go and test the theory, and when you, when you do that, the recommendation is go and test something that is really well established, right? Because that's sort of the best theory that is out there. So there's no point in trying to test something that nobody really cares about in the first instance, right? So test something that is uh, that's very important. So a little story, I knew this, this one guy, he's a professor in Germany now, somewhere. He's a really brilliant guy. He did this fantastic work, really cool design, like a quasi-experimental research design, where he looked at how people in the city of Cologne changed the way they collect, uh, or how, how the city of Cologne collected rubbish. Yeah. So they have these different phases where, I don't know, people had to bring their recycling to these recycling stations, then they kind of changed it in a way where there were kind of rubbish bins put in front of the houses directly in a way and uh, it was a really neat design because they phased that in in time and then you could more or less see the same kind of, I don't know, one street they still had the own system while the other street they had the new system and then you could say, okay, hang on, so what is the only thing that is different here right now is that one folks, one group of people, they have the new system while the other ones still have the old system. Yeah? So that's a nice way of evaluating how, or that's an experimental research design. We'll talk more about that. In a, in a later on during this course. But what is the problem with this, with this research? Well, this guy, great guy, but he tested a theory that nobody cared about in the first instance. Yeah. So when you go and when you test a theory, test something that is important. Yeah. Test something that people really care about. Because otherwise, so what? Yeah. You show that something that we didn't really believe in is not really true. So what? Yeah? That's very weak. So you need to start really strong. You need to start strong, and then you actually, then you need to go, and then keep in mind what I, what I talked about last, last, uh, last week. Then you need to go, and you need to be the devil's advocate. You need to go, and you need to, if, if something that you really believe in, you really need to test really, really hard. So the folks that I really believe in, I read in the most critical way. Right? Because otherwise, you are a, a, a discipline. Yeah? And you don't want to be that, seriously. This is, this is just wrong. Unfortunately, some people do that, but I think it's really, really wrong. So, a little story around that. Not too long ago, you know, I was in this PhD transfer exam here at UCD. I was this examiner together with some other colleagues, you know, some other of my uh, fellow professor colleagues. And the students, they have to show, I don't know, the kind of progress that they made over the last two years. And, and we say, okay, you're good, go on. And, um, and then one of my colleagues, I'm not going to tell you who, you are going to get a crosshair at some point. And um, she uh, basically said to the student that the student should think more about the theory that the student wants to back and then devise a research design around it. So she said the student should first think about the kind of research that, that he wants to back. I was sitting there, I couldn't believe it, because I think it's exactly the opposite of what you want to do. Yeah? You need to have this, you need to have the theory, and then you need to do everything to disprove it. Yeah. 
Remember, the only thing that we can show is that something is truly wrong. We cannot show that something is true. It's this idea of falsifiability. That's the stuff that we talked about the last time. Karl Popper, Falsify, uh, falsifiability. Big, big step, big milestone in the philosophy of social science. So when you have something, you need to do everything to prove it wrong. Right? Or you need to work as hard as you can. So instead of thinking about how you, you back a theory, you should think about how you can disprove it. Yeah. And then you test and then you go about it. And then your test might fail. Yeah? That means, like, I don't know, you, you don't disprove it. But that is great. Yeah? But that means you expose the theory to a really hard test and the theory is still standing there. And um, we, we believe in the things that stands there until the end. Right? So it's the thing that, that uh, we believe in up to this, up to this moment. So in that sense, you know, we can never verify a theory with data, but we can only show if it is wrong. And uh, when starting something, you just think about how to disprove it. So, you now I like to think of this in, finding, in terms of finding the kryptonite. Yeah? You need to find the thing that really pushes something to its edge. Yeah? And when you show that it doesn't fall over, even when you expose it to that, then we can actually we really learn something. Yeah? But if you have a theory and you expose it to a really big test, we didn't learn anything. Yeah? Or only very little. So that's the idea. So we have this idea which is sometimes a little weird to understand, you know, especially when you come from the school, because then you have, well, I don't know, you, you might wonder, this is what we believe in, this is sort of our knowledge and so on. And now I'm telling you, we, we, we only just know, we are at this research frontier and we just believe in the things that, that we haven't shown wrong yet. Yeah. And then we have different theories and these theories go into battle and whichever one wins, that's sort of the one that we accept for the time being. So that's all about our knowledge is. Whenever there's a theory out there, or when there's a model out there, that's actually what it is. It's a theory. It's a model. Yeah? Even though it might be very detailed, it might give us a really good understanding of the world, it's a model. Yeah? At least by definition, it, uh, it is, uh, uh, is different from, from the reality. It's sort of our best shot at explaining what we observe. So when you have a theory, you shouldn't become a disciple of it, but in fact, you should become the opposite of it. So whenever you kind of see yourself getting sucked into something like that, well, you need to know what you're dealing with, yeah? Uh, but when you kind of see yourself getting sucked into something like that, uh, you need to be very cautious about that and become critical of things. Okay, so you can test the theory. Uh, a fifth approach, how we start a research project, or I don't know, how you can have a research question. Well, you can start with social problems. Yeah? You can start with social problems. And I think some social problems are very real. Right? So, you know, keep in mind, last week I said some people say we can only interpret things in sort of construction and so on. But I think some things are really real. People died in the refugee crisis in Europe during the last few years. Right? It's very real. And that's sort of our job as sociologists to kind of, well, I think it is an important job that we have to look at that. Look at, look at the social phenomena that we, that we observe. For example, right now, last week I started this, or well, it's a master's project that I'm supervising right now with a student in public health here at UCD. And we're looking at, uh, we're looking at the health status of refugees in Germany over the last five years. Yeah. Things don't get lost, especially in Germany, you know, everything is so fucking organized. So, uh, so whenever you go to, to the GP, you know, there's a record, especially when you are a refugee. So we, could, so we got hold of, of access to that. Uh, well, not of the ex, actual reports, but you know, there's a financial statements about it. Somebody needs to pay for it at the end of the day. Uh, so we're looking at that data. It will be very descriptive to begin with, but it's nevertheless important. Why? Because it's an important social problem. So there are suddenly millions of refugees in Germany, and we don't know anything about their health status, for example, yeah. or where they come from, yeah. or what age they are. You know, or what gender they have. You know, these kind of things, these are things that questions where our sociology starts. Where you, when you are interested in a social problem, in a social phenomenon. You can, you can, you can look at that. Um, okay, but it can also be that the social world changes. Yeah. And if you look at God, you know, in your lifetime already, the world has changed in such a tremendous way. Yeah? Think about 
the way how the world changed during the lifetime of your parents. It's massive, you know. Maybe they grew up with the first televisions, yeah? or I don't know, first radios, and nowadays, I don't know, we are on Instagram, Snapchat all the time. Yeah? So uh, it's a different world. The world is changing around us. That can be a starting point for your, for your research as well. So, um, so but where do you start when you have such uh, um, uh, uh, a phenomenon like that? You know, like the refugee crisis. And this sort of brings us towards the problematic issues about social problems. You know, I'm always talking about what it is and then what the problems about it is. Because um, you, you might have noble intentions of changing the world. Right? It's making the world better. And some instances like the refugee crisis, in my opinion, it's a no-brainer. Uh, you know, you look at the health status in a way, you don't want people dying. Yeah. But sometimes it's actually not that straightforward. What is sort of the right thing to do? And that's sort of the problem when you kind of start your research like that. Because then very quickly, who tells you, who tells you that this is now the right way to go? Yeah. Who tells you that this is sort of how we should change the world to deal with these social problems? And, you know, it's, uh, uh, it does happen, you know, that actually people listen to what sociologists say. Yeah. Uh, sometimes we get requests here from the government or from other folks or from the media. Sometimes they want to get our opinion on a social social phenomena, on a social problem. Yeah. And uh, uh, and what could the potential consequences of that be? Yeah. And sometimes consequences can be massive. Yeah. Well, in the refugee crisis, you know, as I said, I think it's very straightforward. But what about something else? You know, some people say we should overthrow the political system. Yeah. What would happen then? Yeah. Well, we tried that a few times. We had Bolshevism, we had fascism, and um, scholars had been instrumentalized for particular political ideas. So I think we need to be very careful when we kind of start that, to not get instrumentalized and stay objective. So again, this is sort of my mantra here, stay objective and try to be systematic in your research. Right? So you listen to all of the arguments and then you sort of go with what, what the science and what the data tells you. Okay, so that can be the problem with, uh, with social problems. Lastly, uh, puzzles. Yeah, puzzles. And now we're coming back to uh, the crime rate eventually. Puzzle. What is a puzzle? A research puzzle or a puzzle based approach. A puzzle, this guy David Lambetta, a fascinating guy. He's one of those guys who really flips things around all the time. You have a conversation with him and you're just, your mind is just blown away. Yeah? Because the guy just tells you something, something that you thought you know, suddenly you're completely, you're completely looking at it in a different way. So a puzzle is not just a general topic, such as, for example, the effects of gender on wage. It is a correlation which defies the expectations of common sense or the predictions of some theory. So it's really something that is a little odd, yeah? something that sticks out. And the best of these puzzles are the ones which seem outlandish at first, but once you study them a little more closely, you know, they put our theories to the test and they reveal something really unexpected. Yeah. So how do you find puzzles? Well, you read about it, well, actually, you experience things, just open your eyes, you know, you experience things, puzzles that kind of strike you as an odd. This is sort of where your observation uh, is very important. But then you also see it in the literature where you find something, something, something is odd. Puzzles can be theoretical or empirical in nature. Now I have a bunch of examples for puzzles. So for example, why do women commit suicide more often than men only in China? Everywhere in the world, it's the other way around. Men commit more suicide than women, yeah. except in China. What the hell is up with China? Okay. Why are there so many Islamic terrorists with degrees in engineering and so few with degrees in Islamic studies? It's a little bit. Yeah. It's a puzzle. Why do average IQ scores increase by three points every ten years? Yeah. It's true. You're much more, you're much cleverer than, than I don't know than your grandparents were. Actually, if you would take the IQ test that your grandparents had to take, uh, you would now score I don't know 30, 40 percent higher. You would all be super gifted with that test. Somehow we sort of become more intelligent than our evolution suggests right now. Yeah? It's a puzzle. Why does India, with 1.2 billion citizens, never win medals at the Olympics? At the last Olympics, actually, I checked it this morning. India won the last Olympics, 2016. India won one silver medal and one 
bronze medal. The silver medal was in women's badminton, and the bronze medal was in women's wrestling. Yeah. India has 1.2 billion people. Well, now I can ask you how many medals did Ireland win? Well, Ireland won two silver medals. Ireland won more medals, so to speak, yeah? more silver than India. What is the population of Ireland? It's 4.7 million. It's a fraction of 1.2 billion. It's a puzzle. Now, actually, when you look at the whole history of the Olympic Games, Ireland actually won more medals than India. I think Ireland now won 53 medals, while India won uh, 39. Why do you find the highest rate of plastic surgery in, in, in South Korea? It's a puzzle. Why do Oscar winners live longer? I'm not making that up. There was a study that actually showed that. You know, when you look at the life expectancy of people who win the Academy Award and people who don't, people who win the Academy Award live longer. Actually, I'm having this research project where I'm applying exactly the same idea to the Olympics. Yeah. I look at people who win the the gold medal and people who win the silver medal and people who win the bronze medal and those who just got fourth, right? So they didn't get any medal, but they're sort of, you know, they're sort of, when you are, I don't know, fourth in the Olympic game, you are pretty good anyway. Yeah. But this is a research project I only work on every four years, so whenever there's a, the Olympics, two weeks, this is what I do. I watch the Olympics and I work on this project. Other strange puzzle, and actually the reading for, for Wednesday um, will capture that a little bit. Why are the most books that are stolen from Oxford, from Oxford University libraries theology books? That's very odd. So these are, these are puzzles. Yeah? So um, uh, uh, these are puzzles. How do you find these puzzles? What do you do through your experiences, through your common sense? You read about them, you attend lectures, or you just open your fucking eyes. Yeah? So to solve the thing that we had, is it really a puzzle? Well, the answer is, the country with the highest crime rate is the Vatican. The Vatican, you were not that bad. Um, this is the puzzle. You could say, ah, we knew it all, the, all along. But um, I'll talk more about it next time, but it's about how we calculate crime rate. It's the number of people that live there, and there are not an awful amount of people living there in the Vatican. So the reading for Wednesday are these 20 pages by Elster. On the web, I put on a little more, but only read the first 20 pages of it. Yeah? Okay, thanks.